Stargate Voyager. I think we're looking again at a lost technology. And it was this ancient apocalypse 12,800 years ago that wiped that from the human memory banks. Why were these ancient elongated skulled peoples or humanoids of Malta living underground? Now I believe we're talking prior to 9700 BC for the original construction of the Sphinx. And they were what some people have called giants, probably no more than seven to eight feet tall. And those giants have been pulled out of American mounds. Whether it's the colossal statue heads that have been unearthed, to all the strange artifacts you've been showing in the museums, to some of the strange features they seem to possess, the more I learn about the Omet culture, uh, really the more fascinated I become. I want to invite you to join us on one of our upcoming tours this spring and summer. We've got Egypt coming May 8th through the 19th. We're going to have a private visit inside the Great Pyramid. We're going to see the Great Sphinx of Giza up close. We're going to go underground and see these massive boxes in the Serapium. We're going to see these colossal megalithic statues. And we are going to look for evidence of lost ancient technology all over Egypt. June 30th through July 6th, we're going to be in England. We're going to have a private visit in Stonehenge. We're going to go inside crop circles and uh, fathom the phenomenon. We're going to go inside ancient megalithic burial chambers. We are going to consider the legends of ancient giants. And it's going to be an England trip uh, unlike no other. In August, we've got the Peru and Bolivia tour. Go to Machu Picchu. We're going to go to Sacsayhuaman and see these colossal 100 ton plus walls. We're going to see elongated skulls. We're going to dip into Bolivia and go to Puma Punku and see these H blocks and all of the strange humanoid statues. I hope you'll join us. Go to stargatevoyager.com slash tours to register. Well, I am really excited to be joined by a newer friend of mine, uh, Rumi Lakta. He is a uh, explorer, researcher, and a Peruvian tour guide that specializes um, in tours to Machu Picchu. He was one of our uh, tour guides on our last trip in October. Rumi, you were an incredible tour guide. I loved your passion. I loved your depth of insight. And uh, thank you for joining me today. It's a pleasure to be with you and also to see you again. You know, so especially after to, I finish today a tour in Machu Picchu. Well, I am ready for your questions. I am ready what you want to hear about all the, the things, all the Inca secrets, all the uh, secrets in Cusco. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited, man, because you're like you're like the next generation of tour guides that are emerging in around the world, but like in Peru and the Cusco area and Machu Picchu. Um, and we can get into how Department of Tourism really controls a lot of knowledge and they control the tourism industry. And so you kind of really have to be careful what you say publicly and online. Yet it was so cool to go to Peru and meet a tour guide like you, licensed. You guys go through rigorous training yet you are willing to uh, admit and tell us off the record the true history of Peru. So can you give us a little bit of your story? You grew up around Machu Picchu in the shadow of the mountain. Tell us about how you grew up and how you became a tour guide. Well, uh, my family is from here. My father is from Cusco. Obviously, he's an Inca descender, my father. Yes, uh, and it's true. His uh, last name is uh, Auca. To means a warrior in the Quechua language. Yes, well, I grow here. Uh, to grow here, it was a little bit different. I saw how the tourism were changing. Uh, especially, I saw my father. He was very different than everybody because he was a builder, a stone mason, especially a stone mason. He told me, I don't know what, I don't like the concrete. I like only the stones. He always was different than everybody. He did his own house with the stones, shaping, carving every day. And every day we're trying to do like the Inca's buildings, his fountains. Even his house was like one Inca building. For me, it was when I was a child was, wow, <laughs> my father is crazy. Or what happened? I used to think. But then 
uh, I was feeling his his, his feel is really feeling uh, because uh, this passed uh, generation by generation through our hearts. And then I understood my father, especially since I finished tourism. Uh, I finished tourism because I wanted to go to see Machu Picchu every day. I was always focused over there. Uh, my mother uh, was a, an artisan. Uh, she used to work in the handicraft. She used to make handicraft things. And I used to go close to Machu Picchu every day. Sometimes we used to walk at night and we used to see lights at night. And this is no, no because I want to uh, change our history, but it's real what I saw, especially when I was a child. I saw lots of lights through Machu Picchu around, and I used to ask to my mother, why is that? And for my mother, it was a normal, was a normal, we, because we used to back to our home from the handicraft market to what's close to Machu Picchu, you used to back at 7 p.m. And then finally I was working on the Inca Trail for 10 years, working every day, hiking the mountains. And then uh, after I finished that incredible experience because I meet people from the world, from the whole planet with different things. Uh, I, even uh, I learned my English uh, as much possible because uh, it's different language. And then uh, to the one Canadian company, they put me to be a tour guide along Peru. I was a tour guide in Nazca. I was a tour guide in the more uh, exotic and incredible places in Peru, like the megalithic areas. I, I, I flew Nazca three times. I did Tiguanaco. I did the uh, Lake Titicaca. I lived in megalithic zones, the more strange places in Peru. And since one time I met one friend, uh, he took me to these wakas, especially to these giant buildings. And he told me histories that in the beginning was very strange for me. Why? And they took me to incredible buildings inside the caves, inside the places. And I was starting to open my eyes. I, uh, and also I was trying to under, understand what is this. Since that time, uh, I was studying, reading books. I was investigating. I was going into the caves and I was trying to learn how to read the, the stones. And now I, I can say, uh, I know a little bit to read the rocks. So, but this is uh, take a lot of experience because uh, we don't have uh, much information uh, of this history, uh, especially because uh, all our history was delayed by the Spanish and by the Catholic Church, especially in these times, uh, still it's a little bit dangerous to talk about uh, some histories that is in Peru, uh, especially when we share photos or when we share videos, uh, always the Ministry of the Culture is watching us. Uh, and it's true what I said, you know, that, that's the reason uh, I do as, as much uh, possible, uh, you know, caring where I go, where I put, or caring even my work, especially my work. You know? So they can cancel my, my license and that's it. <laughs> Something else that I think has made you what you are today is the fact that your dad was a stonemason, right? So that that's that's so that's so key to your story because you know when we're talking about these megalithic stones and blocks, you've got that perspective of your father showing you how hard it is to craft stone with what tools and what materials. So you had that, but then let me ask you again. You said you grew up looking up over Machu Picchu and you guys would see lights. And and oh, to, yes. did, did you say to your mom it was normal? For my mama it was normal because she grew over there also. And she so you guys in, you yeah. guys would look up and you'd see these lights and were they like orbs flashing across the sky? Did you see them descend? Tell me a little bit more about that. When I was a child, especially eight years, especially eight years old, well, I used to come back uh, helping my mother, especially to help his handicrafts. Uh, I, we used to back at 7 p.m. And two nights I saw uh, incredible, incredible lights uh, crossing Machu Picchu. And I used to ask my mother, what, does, what is that? What, what happened over there? And my mother used to tell me, we used to see, my mother told me, I used to see since I was a little lady, a baby, uh, uh, but now I think uh, Machu Picchu has that energy to get these lights. Uh, I finished for the energy. Now I know. 
because oh. I climbed many times. Even I, I, I was at night in Machu Picchu three times. You brought up energy. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell our audience your your favorite pieces of information about the energy of Machu Picchu in these sites and how that relates to the Intihuantanas. Uy. <laughs> well, now I know why the, the Incas, they did Intihuatana in Machu Picchu. Uh, it's a secret, uh, this thing, but I will share with you. Uh, the Incas, uh, they used to care of one special mummies, uh, especially the elongated mummies. They used to put in the gates and the portals. Uh, these uh, elongated mummies, they were they were living with the Incas for thousands of years, and they were the, the teachers. They were the professors of the Incas. Uh, the Incas, they did Machu Picchu through a two natural geological falls. Why? The people, they ask why they did through about the natural falls. Because they knew very well too, this is a connection between the two energies, the sun and the planet, female and male. And they call to this meeting, to this meeting they call Yananting, Masinting. This is in the Quechua language. That's the reason they did the Intihuatanas, because the Intihuatanas are forget the energy of the sun and for provide to the planet that energy for keep green the area. That is the reason they did Intihuatanas. No, it's only a sun watcher or only because to pray the sun or only to pray the energy. No, it's an special area where the sun passes the energy and this top of the mountain, he get that energy and he pass through the through the natural magnetic force to the earth. And that's the reason uh, when the Spanish, they come to, to Cusco, uh, I hear one history, one laying of the people from here. They say between professors and between uh, teachers in Machu Picchu, because in Machu Picchu used to live only Incas professors and Incas teachers. Uh, Incas priests and, and queens or ladies priests, they used to live together and they talked together uh, asking uh, if they will left to pass to the Spanish to Machu Picchu or not. And they say no. They put an artifact and make with the stones to always get rain, to always have rain in this area. That's the reason the Spanish, they were looking for the golden city, El Dorado, and they never found it because they were looking only the gold, but they don't were looking for the city of the sun. That is Machu Picchu. Yes, there. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you said a bunch there that is probably blowing the minds of my listeners and my mind. So, okay, we've got Machu Picchu, the lost city, the golden city. It's like it's like a citadel on the mountain. It's It's just mind-blowing, right? A lot of people yes. don't realize that, you know, 90% of what you see at Machu Picchu is what we would call the Inca construction. It's the small stones with mortar. But as you look close, it's all built on top of what looks like a much older megalithic foundation that could be 10,000 BC, as crazy as that sounds. So, so you've got that, but then you've got the Inca and when we say Inca, that really means the ruling class. It wasn't the whole civilization. So I want to go back to, you said the Inca, the ruling class were up on Machu Picchu. They likely built on top of the older foundations. But yes. they are, their teachers, their professors were these elongated skull humanoids and these are the these are the mummies we find in the skeletons in in Paracas and Waiki, the the humanoid we saw at the museum, massive elongated skulls, huge eye sockets. There is no way these are these are just genetically humans. Tell us more about who this race was and what it was like. You, are you saying they were some of them were actually alive during the time of the Inca? Yes, uh, some of them they were still living between the Incas. Uh, we must to understand to these uh, professors and to these teachers, they were living with the Incas. They were the, the priest class. They were the professors. The Incas, they were a political time. 
the, the, it was the political time of the Incas. But these professors, they were living through different civilizations. They were living through Wari. They were living through Tiwanaku. They were living through Paracas. All, they, they were the same, developing his mind, developing his technology, especially to work with the energy. I found lots of artifacts, moon artifacts, sun artifacts, a mathematical artifacts, everything made on the stones. All of them, they work with the shadows of the sun, with the shadows of the moon, with the shadows of the stars, all of them. And it's uh, difficult to believe to all was made by the indigenous. It's very difficult. So the more the more uh, a safe uh, thing to the people, even to the other tour guys and other to elder people who are living through, through Peru, they, they believe now uh, they were made by the professors, by the elongated head people. They yeah. did all of it. You're saying you believe the elongated skulled humanoids actually built, are you saying built the megalithic constructions? Yes. Yes. Of course, yes, because yeah. they do elongated head people. They got that technology to make about the natural geological fells. Knowing to the energy of the planet is coming from there to be a connection with the sun. They right. did a kind of map, and it was in Cusco called Seques, no, and it was working with the stars and also with the magnetic. No, it's the natural uh, formation of the planet. No, the, the 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 connection of the planet, and they did his wakas on the top of this. They don't did his wakas, his altars everywhere or or in the top of the mountain. No, they did always in the top of the natural formation of the natural geological falls. Right, and when you say these wakas, mm -hmm. these are these. Uh, wakas are different than the Intiwantanas, correct? The wakas are like these, what looks like a megalithic altar that you just find all over the Cusco Highlands, correct? Yes. Probably uh, the most uh, thing to I understood is from the one, it was in the whole America, it was one ancient civilization to use to control all. This super civilization I don't know where is the capital. Some people, they say it was in Tiwanaku, did all of these temples, following the geological map, the geological falls of the planet. They did his pyramids everywhere. And the Chacana, the Chacana, that symbol, it was, it is, this is the secret, this is the key. I know now to this Chacana is the key, it's a map. That map, of Chacana took you to Machu Picchu. I had a revelation, if that's a, an appropriate word, of on this last trip of the Chacana and the Intiwantanas and the Hoacas that you're mentioning. And if you're watching on YouTube or Spotify, you're going to see video and uh, photos of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a visual, but Rumi, I loved you being our tour guide because you were pointing out all these huacas and all these hidden symbolism that your average tourist would totally miss if they were just with some normal tour. So thank you so much. Um, I want to go back to, again, the elongated skull, skull, what I call humanoids, because this is big stuff we're talking about here. You're saying that you sure. believe the elongated skull humanoids that we now still see mummies of in Paracas and at the, what's that museum called where Waikis located? It, it's, it's a Andawailia's museum. It, okay. It's in Andawailia. Uh -huh. So you're saying this ruling class, you believe, built the megalithic structures with lost ancient technology. Um, I, I want to ask you about the elongated skull at that museum. Um, it's known as the Waiki alien or the Waiki humanoid. Because you told me something that blew my mind. Because I had seen it before on my last trip to Peru. This massive, elongated, skulled mummy. But it's got this, uh, you can see not just a hole in its head, but what looks like it was cut out. And you were sharing the legends of why there's a hole in its head. 
it's because it had a golden device that yes. enabled it to communicate with the gods. Tell us more about that. I will revelate something. When the Spanish, they went to these huacas, he was reading through a books of the Sarmiento de Gamboa, ancient Spanish chronics, to, to the Incas, they used to go to the huacas to talk with his gods. One of these days, uh, one of these Spanish went to see what happened, why this, they go to the caves or they go to the huacas. And when he went over there, he heard uh, one of the Incas talking with the huacas, talking with the mummies. And I heard the history today they used to put in the elongated heads, they used to make cirugies to the head to incrustate the gold, especially in the top of the some babies, because they were uh, oracles, they were able to connect with the gods or with the <laughs> with the aliens probably. And no, that's they used to be in, able in to talk with the sky. Right. Mm -hmm. So the even during the Inca time, at all of these ancient sites or hoacas, one of my favorite sites is uh, Nuapa Iglesia, right? Mm -hmm. It's the what I call the megalithic cave of mystery. And yeah. at that cave where there's this megalithic like portal carved into the side of the mountain, you were uh, revealing to us how even in the Inca time in the 1400s, in the back of that cave, they would pull out this elongated skull mummy in on the solstice. I think it's June 21st, correct? Mm -hmm. They would place yeah. they would place the mummy in the portal or stargate uh, cutout, and it would basically they would use it as an oracle to communicate with the gods. It would speak even though it was a dead mummy, correct? Yes, I discovered something very interesting reading the books uh, to why in 21 of June the, the spirit of these people used to come because Orion Bell constellation becomes as a feline to give to, to give the energy to the lives. And it's possible to see only during 21 of June, during the day, this Orion Bell constellation. And how would we know that? Thank you to one uh, uh, mestizo, one Inca chronics from the 16th century. He drew something very interesting to play there in the future. Probably will share you the imagine to is giving the life or the spirit to the mummies, to the elongated mummies, to make them alive, especially during this day. And that's the, the that's the reason the Incas they used to go through these windows to talk with them. And they say, what I read, no, it's not my invention. <laughs> people believe, sometimes people, because I, I I share photos and videos also in Facebook, and some people, they say, no, this is not a dimensional gate. But when you look in the Inca beliefs, you will find it's true. Those Incas, they were able to talk with the mummies especially in 21 of June and 21 of December. 21 of June is because the portals, the spiritual gates are open to Orion Bell. That is representing by the felines, by the pumas or by the jaguars, or could be lions. And 21 of December is the feather snake, is the, 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 the summer solstice. In these two dates, in these two especially days, the portals to the constellations open. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think one of my favorite parts of our tour was when we were at Napa Iglesia and the majority of the group had left and went back down the mountain. And again, if you're watching on YouTube or Spotify, you're going to see which, which side I'm talking about. But this is a megalithic cave located high in the Andes Mountains. You have to do a, quite a hike up to this cave in the mountains. And inside is what looks like a megalithic portal. Um, the crazy part is, when most of the group had left, there was still a minister of tourism up there, you know, a watchdog watching us. I better be careful what I'm saying, but basically he let us go up into the back 
of that cave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and I'm going to do a feature video on this, which will feature Rumi. But <laughs> we got to go into the back of this cave. And I was overwhelmed with just the history that was, I guess, standing on my shoulders. As we were in the back of the cave where the Inca were hiding these mummies. And you also pointed out that there was hidden megalithic walls underneath and everything. So I can't wait to to get that video out. Um, I was blown away when we went to the uh, moon temple. I think it was the Templo de da Luna. And you took mm-hmm. us into the, it was like the secret chamber where there was an altar inside and the light was shining through the top. Tell us oh, more yeah. about that. The, after to I finished the tour with you, I got back with a one elder man, a, a maestro, a Peruvian maestro. I went inside with another a jungle maestro, Peruvian maestro. We went to explore, to see. And in the first time, I knew very well to this temple of the moon works with the moon, of course. But later, this uh, maestro, he teach me, what is this? He told me there is a stone in the front of this, looks like an eye, the temple of the moon, you know very well. No? And he told me this is a kind of artifact. When you stop in the other stone, if you know how to say some words or some mantras, your spirit can go inside of this and it can go wherever you want. And you remember the cuts in the top of one big stone? You remember, Derek? This is a brain. This is a big brain. In my second time I went there, I was watching. There is a stone like a one hand watching the big brain. That stone looks a big brain with lots. And the, in this part is the, the cut of the rock. And over there, uh, I was watching for half an hour. And I understood the words. There is a something like a writing, like a QR in all of this. Like a, and I asked it to the to the professor, uh, teacher, my friend Cucho is his name. Uh, who did that? To the Incas did that, and he say, obviously no, those artifacts they were already here. He told me. There are thousands, thousands of years, he told me. There is there is uh, legends and oral traditions that when the Spanish arrived and conquered Cusco and they asked the Inca who built this, even the Inca said, we didn't build it, it was already here, correct? Yes, because some of the Huacas, they were already there. Of course, they... they uh, only the royal class, they used to say, no, I did, my ancestors did it. But even in the Incas lay and say to the first Incas, they don't were like a normal people. They were like with different powers. One of the one of these Incas used to fly. The other one used to move mountains. His layers are like that. And I believe to the Inca descenders, especially to the uh, that elongated heads, they were the, the real and original ancestors. Even before the Spanish, they come to Peru, they were in a civil war. For which reason? For the mummies. One more time. For okay. the mummies. No. So, so the civil. You're saying the civil war between the Inca at right as the Spanish are coming to conquer. Um, uh-huh. That civil war was over. Who would get possession of these elongated skulled mummies? Yes, it was because uh, they were two brothers. Uh, they were mummies everywhere of the last of the years because they used to, they were found in, they were found in, on the ground and they were putting on all the altars in all the temples the mummies. But the Atahualpa, the Inca from Ecuador, he say we want to keep the tradition because we come from these mummies. We are this, and Huascar, the other brother from the south, he was trying to change all that religion. He was trying to take out the mummies, to put all the mummies on the ground. That's the reason they were in a civil war, because they... So do you believe... Tell us, real, tell us real quick your theories on how you believe the ancient elongated skulled builder class built 
a lot of this? Was it with um, levitation technology? What kind of technology do you think enabled them to build these walls that feature 100 plus ton mortarless walls, blocks? Yeah, well, there is one, is, there is a lots of buildings even under Cusco. There is lots of caves. And you saw when we went inside the Temple of the Moon, you saw blowing from the ground. Uh, the Layans say there is a, a snake people cities inside of around Cusco and along the Andes. We call to these places chincanas, to these caves. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, there is a Layan to one of the first Incas. Uh, in the Incas, Layans are the secrets. The first Inca, he got one instrument called Tupac Yauri. His God, he promised to him to remain a new city, looking for a new opportunity to refound a city. And he used that Tupac Yauri. It was a big stick, golden, made with gold, very special. And he threw to the center of Cusco, according to the legend, and all the mountains were moving. And I was reading a, a new book, the Inca Foundation, and I probably am not sure completely that a stick was powerful. It used to have a power to cut the rocks, to move the stones. Because we went to the caves together, and when you saw the, the cut of the rocks, it looks like it was made by machinery. It don't look was made by hands. I, am a, I, I, I was working with my father as a stone mason. Uh, we know very well how it's to work with the stones. Uh, and you'd never give this this uh, shadow of the stones only with hands. Uh, you can give, but you all, all, always you see holes, little holes in the rocks. But like a like a vitrification or like a glass or like the glass, never. It's difficult. It's impossible with the uh, indigenous technology. It's impossible. No, the ancient aliens. I don't know. I don't know how to call. They come one day and they left some professors and some teachers. They left here trying to help the indigenous. And they were trying to mix with the, with the indigenous people. In his way, they deformate also the indigenous people. The indigenous people, when they saw the original, they were changing his heads. I, wa I was reading one interesting book about one interesting uh, science that is called phrenologia. That phrenologia uh, 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 science changed the, the head of the people. For example, during that time, those professors, they used to change the people. If they wanted to be a militars, they used to change light they used to make grow the backside and if they want the people or thinkers they used to make grow the head like this horizontal no vertical horizontal way that's the reason there are two kind of uh, human deformation but the original why the originals they did that to the humans this is something really intrigate that changed also my mind i say why there are two different elongated heads. There is one with uh, big, and the other one is like the ends. <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> to change the order, even if they are, uh, even even if they are uh, artificial, made by people, even if they are uh, modified by people, someone did. Right. Someone changed the head of the indigenous. Right. Yeah. There's. There's. It's multi-layered. You've got mm -hmm. the indigenous culture who was practicing cradle headboarding, mm -hmm. but why were they doing it? They were emulating the original older class mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. had the naturally elongated skulls that have so many genetic anomalies. There's no way it's, it was just through a uh, head binding, right? You've got skulls with some of them have what? Almost 50% more cranial mass than ours. Even they are heavier. Even they are heavier. They are not like our brains. Even uh, if you look for the investigation of Brian Foster or other investigators like are in Peru, 
uh, you will find to in the in the bones, especially in the back side, they have uh, a different bones. They are not similar than everybody. They have a kind of triangle in the back side of the head. Yes, uh, there is a one Mister called uh, Cabrera. It's the Mister Cabrera Fronica. He found an ancient rocks also close to these elongated heads. People with dinosaurs, people with making cirrhosis, people uh, passing blood to other people. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. And I don't believe to this person did himself to cheat the people. He found 40,000 stones. And the Peruvian governments, they say always, no, that is not uh, real. Always, when they found a new mummy that is different, they say, no. Uh, you are stealing, or you are yeah, you robber, or mm -hmm. this is the the history of Peru. There. How can people follow you and stay up to date with everything you're doing? I have uh, one Instagram. My Instagram is called uh, Peru Megalithic. You no, know, if, if you want to see the photos. And, and some proofs, you can follow that. You've got a great uh, Facebook account. Uh, what's Is that just a personal account or is that a page? Well, in, in Facebook, I have lots of followers. I, I am joining the, the new generation of people, the new believers. So, well, the, my Facebook is uh, Rumi Alegria Suniga. Rumi Alegria Suniga. Over there, I put an incredible photographies. Normally, every week I go to a new archaeological site because it's my hobby. I just, I just trying to to understand the, what they say. And now they it, I know how to read the, the stones because this is a system of writing. Yeah. I, are, mm -hmm. Since you bring that up, I want to ask you about that too. Um, so yes, follow Rumi on Instagram, um, at Peru Megalitico, and then he's on Facebook. Um, and I would say Rumi is one of the, if you, if you want to see the anomalies of Peru, Rumi is the number one source, follow him. Uh, he's putting out, I mean, great photos every day, great videos every day. It's, it's nonstop because he's at these sites every day. So, um, Rumi, I want to ask you real quick. One thing that you really helped me to see on this last trip was the hidden symbolism in everything. You know, the, the Inca and the ancients before them, you know, it was all about the three worlds. You got the Puma and the Condor and the serpent, right? And you see these symbols hidden everywhere at every site in all the walls uh -huh. um tell our listeners real quick at uh oyante tambo one of the greatest sites in peru at the very top you've got the massive wall called the uh, gate of the sun and you were pointing out tell us what that was like ten thousand years ago um Wait what that wall was like and what faces were on it and what it did when the moonlight hit it. <laughs> yes, I know what you want to know. <laughs> well, the Sacred Ballet Festival, it, uh, it was the reflection of the Milky Way. All the cities to are in like Ollantaytambo, Pisa, Chinchero, they are the reflection of the stars. And Machu Picchu is the finish of the Milky Way is the Orion Bell Gate. Well, who did this? Why? Uh, Ollantaytambo, for example, that megalithic area was made it probably 10,000, probably even, even more, <laughs> thousands years old. Uh, they were as less uh, three civilizations because the Chacana is like three steps. And this is not only uh, a symbol, it is, is only also a time. Means, means change. Means 
the first generations of you must to this is an ancient book to i was reading from one mister called jesus gamarra say to the first civilization when the planet was with not many people the first humanity was made on the sacred valley that history say that this is not my history this is if you look for the book is called paraguayso and the writer is called jesus gamarra that big kind of quotes this is called an ampacha civilization that means the first ones the second i say about 15000 years old is the big walls building made by a kind of humanity like giants and everything here is a cyclic it's not lying for us it's never is lying our history is not lying everything is cyclic every 500000 years or every 10000 years uh, something happened in the planet destruction reset and one more time new generation and the last one is our generation smaller but still the second generation they did oyantaytambo with the spanish they went to oyantaytambo it used to shine the whole world you shine as a as a mirror it was as a mirror and when you used to go in the front of this temple you used to see yourself it was something incredible it was for ref the reflection of the sun and it was for the reflection of the moon this secret told me one one friend from yantaitamo he's he's a natural from there he told me one day he went at night when it was the pandemic and he saw his reflection in the in the in that temple and he told me that history and then when the spanish priests he, he saw that it was something is opar on the time they say it's not made by that indians they say it was made for someone else and they ordered to to destroy to cut all the proofs to give in a normal history to give like well was made by by humans destroy the the mirror destroy all the symbols there is the puma there the, especially the felines i'm not sure if there is the puma no there right. are three felines, three felines big felines and there is the chacana over there three chacanas uh -huh. yeah yeah at all these sites you see these intiuntanas or the chacana symbols or like you pointed out at the gate of the sun at the top of oyante tambo are these protrusions that come out and you're saying in prehistory these were actually feline type puma faces it's just mind-blowing to consider so we've got you, you brought up jesus uh garama's books where he talks yes. about um the legend of the hanan pacha or the three worlds mm -hmm. and so tell me if i'm right in this room you've got You've got number one, the Hanan Pacha, or the first culture. And this is the oldest civilization, according to this theory, who shaped the bedrock. Because like when you're walking around Cusco, uh -huh. all these rock outcroppings are like laser cut, just protruding mm -hmm. out of the rocks like somebody had a laser and they were just practicing. So the Hanan Pacha, according to this theory, could shape the bedrock and then they built the biggest walls like at Sacsayhuaman, right? And then you've got the Uran Pacha uh -huh. or they're also the known as the Sapa Rumi, the second culture. And you're yes. saying they, they engineered some of the smaller sized precision megaliths, maybe like at Machu Picchu, the, the foundations. Then we've got the, the last culture, the Ukun Pacha. Ukun Pacha is the last one. Yeah. Ukun Pacha. And this Anampacha, was the Wari or the Inca? They were the, the Waris. The and wari. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, and the Waris the Waris came along and literally just built on top of these first two cultures. Mm -hmm. exactly. and, and that's why it gets so confusing when you go to these sites, you see all these different building techniques. And main, <laughs> the mainstream the mainstream just points and gives the last civilization the credit for everything. Uh -huh. It's crazy. <laughs> yes. And if you go against that, 
let's end with this. You were telling me how you've got to be careful as a licensed tour tour guide. You got to be careful what you say and post online because you told me one time you posted a photo and suddenly you were contacted, right? Yes. Sometimes they call you. <laughs> They'll call you up and say, Hey, why are you when posting I was, that? Uh -huh, when I was in the bus, I was guiding you. Uh, yes, someone called me from the archaeological site. Oh, don't put that photo. He told me, Yes. <laughs> yes, that's, that's why I was there in the morning. <laughs> well, Rumi, thank you so much for your time and thank you for being such an incredible guide um, mm -hmm. in in Peru. If you if you take if you go to uh, Peru to the Cusco or Machu Picchu area or Sacred Valley, make sure mm -hmm. you contact Rumi as your guide because he's one of the best. Uh, you also uh, take Brian Forster around at times. So again, follow him on Instagram on facebook you're also on tiktok and um Rumi, is there anything else you want to say as we say goodbye well so <laughs> it, it's been a pleasure uh, to connect with you derek you are also an incredible person so i'm sure you will find what you are looking for you are looking for the answer i'm sure uh, the whole planet has the answers uh, i am finding my answers I am I'm sure I am very close, very, very close. I am 80% to get the answer. Hey, I really I really enjoyed riding the train back from Machu Picchu with you. And uh, we, we were by this cart, this extra train car where you could get out of your seat and go open the windows and just look at the mountains. And even as we were looking at the mountains, you were pointing out all these megalithic uh, sites hidden in the mountains that, again, most tour groups never visit. It was amazing. And so I want to close by saying, join Rumi and I this August on our next Peru tour. It's going to be incredible. Rumi's going to be there and he's going to be revealing more uh, ancient secrets and knowledge. So we hope to see you there. You, you can click the show notes in this podcast to get all the information or go to stargatevoyager.com slash tours for all the info. Rumi, thanks so much, my friend. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's nice to see you. <laughs> blesses, blesses. <laughs> see you soon.